Hello everyone and welcome back to Historian Splaining. This is another installment in my series on the history of the United States in 100 objects and this one will be specifically for my patrons and my list of patrons has been growing and this is one of my ways of uh, rewarding you. So this will be the fourth object that I discuss and it's a very special one for a lot of reasons. One is that it's the first object of European origin. So it's possibly the, f the earliest object known from anywhere in the United States that actually indicates contact and exchange between America and Europe. Although as I'll discuss, it's surrounded by mystery and disputes since it was discovered in the 1950s. So I'm going to talk today about what I call the main Norse coin. It's been called by various different names, sometimes the main penny or the Goddard coin because it was found at the so-called Goddard site in Maine. It's a small coin made of a silver alloy. It was minted in Norway during the reign of Olaf Kira, somewhere between about 1069 and 1080 AD, and it was reportedly found at a Native American archaeological site at Naskayag Point near Brooklyn, Maine. The coin is severely corroded and a large part of it has crumbled, but nonetheless one can still see on one side of the coin what looks like a bird-like figure but which was actually part of a depiction of the Norwegian king, Olaf. And on the other side, one sees a simple cross set within a circle, which is fairly typical of medieval Norse coins. And the coin is today held in the collection of the Maine State Museum. So what is the story of this coin and why has it been a subject of dispute and debate uh, much more so than any of the previous objects that I've talked about so far in this series. Well, it was found by a local amateur archaeologist in Maine named Guy Melgren. He kept it together with a collection of thousands of objects that he found at sites around Maine, particularly the Goddard site. And as part of this collection, he donated it to the Maine State Museum in 1974. Now, Guy Melgren told the Maine State Museum and scholars that he found it in August 1957 while he was digging at the Goddard site, which is a large site on this peninsula near Brooklyn, uh, basically on a point of land in between Deer Isle and Mount Desert Island. He said that when he found it, it had a perforation in it, as if it had been used for a pendant or an ornament. But that part of the coin has since crumbled from weakness and corrosion. Guy Melgren reportedly thought little about the coin, particularly uh, before he donated it in the 1970s. Scholars initially misidentified the coin as being an English coin dating to the reign of King Stephen. But uh, soon after, when observations about the coin were published in a main archaeological bulletin, the conclusion was corrected, and rather coin experts uh, identified it instead as a Norwegian coin. And in 1979, an archaeologist from the University of Oslo actually traveled in person to Maine to observe and ex examine the coin firsthand and he positively identified it as a coin minted in the reign of Olaf Kira, also called Olaf the Peaceful, who reigned in Norway from 1069 to 1093. And more specifically, it was part of the so-called series or class N coins. So scholars over time have, have examined and classified medieval Norwegian coins and put them into numbered or properly lettered categories. This one is from type N, and it comes from early in the reign of Olaf Kira, before 1080. 
Coins of this particular type do survive from various sites, both inside and outside Norway, but they're fairly rare compared to coins, for example, from the reign of Olaf's father, Harald Hardrada, which are somewhat more common. And as I said, it was discovered at the Goddard site, which was a major large settlement and trading site on the coast of Maine, which reached its peak of flourishing between about 1180 and 1230 AD. So from its reported uh, discovery location, it's reasonable to suppose that the coin was possessed, used, and eventually lost or discarded at this site by no later than the 1200s AD. So if the coin is genuine, and if it was discovered at the Goddard site, then it raises a number of possibilities and questions. Does it indicate that there was a Norse settlement as far down as the coast of Maine? Uh, did, did Vikings or later Norsemen reach that far down into the North American mainland? Alternatively, does it mean that Norse people traveled, explored, or traded up and down the coast of North America. Well, all of these are intriguing possibilities that the coin raises, but it's important to note, as every scholar notes, that no other Norse artifacts were found at or near the Goddard site. This coin seems to be unique. So not surprisingly, a lot of scholars have questioned whether the coin is genuine or if it might be a hoax. And this is important to keep in mind because there have been many hoax rune stones, swords, helmets, and other sorts of Viking or Norse uh, artifacts supposedly found around America, most of which have been positively uh, discredited as fake. And in one very important incident, the Royal Ontario Museum in Canada actually accepted as genuine a horde of Viking artifacts uh, supposedly found in Canada in the 1930s, and it was only 20 years later in the 50s that it was revealed to be a hoax, and naturally the curators of the Royal Ontario Museum had a great deal of egg on their face, so scholars are very wary to accept as real anything that might possibly be uh, a hoax or a fake. Nonetheless, uh, European scholars, particularly from Norway, have absolutely positively verified the coin as authentically dating to the reign of Olaf Kira from before 1080. So the, the authenticity of the object itself is not in doubt. And as I said, it specifically falls into class N, of the Olaf Kira coins. However, it is also unique and slightly unusual. Some of its features do not exactly match the patterns of any other known coins. So it's authentic, it is unique, but it is still questioned and debated whether it could have really been found at the Goddard site in 1957. And some have insinuated or even openly accused Guy Melgren of lying about how he found and acquired the coin. So some have alleged that the, uh, the supposed discovery of the coin might have been an attempt to extend the sphere of Viking contact with North America uh, to sort of promote uh, archaeology in the New England region and give it a greater significance and a greater connection to Europe. And experts, for example, at the American Numismatic Society in recent years have argued that the Olaf Kira Class N coin could have been acquired on the open market and that other similar coins were uh, circulated and sold, particularly by the University of Oslo, over the course of the late 1800s and early 1900s, and that one particular cache of coins was sold off at auction in 1948. And it's known that some American buyers uh, bought the bulk of that, of that cache in 1948. And so it's been suggested that this might have been the actual source by which, uh, one, by one route or another, Guy Melgren uh, got his hands on this particular coin, which he then planted or falsely claimed to have found in Maine. 
However, that being said, just last year in 2017, the Norwegian archaeologist Svein Gulbeck at the University of Oslo uh, examined the provenance and the records of known Olaf Kira coins uh, as they have circulated in the world. And he makes a series of points that support, in his view, the argument that the find is genuine and that Guy Melgren did not and could not have acquired this coin on the market, but that it must have been truly found where uh, he said in Maine. So among the points that he makes are firstly that 95% of all the Olaf Kira rain coins that have been found in the world were discovered in Norway, mostly in hordes and in graves, but occasionally also in small single finds. So most of these coins, it seems, stayed within Norway. Only a small a scattering of finds have been found in other European countries, uh, such as uh, Sweden, Denmark, and Britain. So it seems that they were not all that widely circulated, especially because of their poor quality. Okay, so this coin, it's sometimes referred to as a silver coin, but it's actually made of an alloy that's only about one-third silver. So Norse coins of this period are not very high quality or high value, uh, either today or back in the 11th century. And so they were not uh, collected and circulated that frequently. And, and in fact, archaeological sites around Europe often have more coins from places like Byzantium uh, than from Norway. So they, the finds are pretty rare. And for example, uh, England is one of the main countries where they have been found outside Norway. And only eight specimens have been discovered mainly due to metal detectors and of course metal detecting is a great uh, pastime in England uh, but nonetheless only eight have been discovered. Furthermore all the coins all uh, archaeological uh, medieval coins found in Norway are by law public property. This is Norwegian law and by law they must be reported, recorded, and kept track of. Right? So information about all the registered finds of old coins in Norway are, is collected at archives and museums, uh, and most often the coins themselves are requisitioned and, and acquired by university or library collections. Coins that are found and traded on the open market uh, in Norway quickly come to scholarly attention. So there are experts who study these coins for their historical value, and when information about them surfaces anywhere in the world, it usually gets back fairly quickly to this expert scholarly community, and they are recorded and kept track of. The largest number of Olaf Kira period coins that's ever been found and examined comes from the so-called Gresley Hoard, which included more than 2,000 coins, most of them from this reign period, and most of them are duplicates, right? So they, they most of them are were minted using the same molds and are exactly uh, identical to some other coin in the hoard. So this has been uh, the source of most of the uh, Olaf Kira coins that are found in the world outside the University of Oslo. And sales to U.S. buyers that have made their way to America are extremely rare. But as I mentioned before, one particular set was sold off by a postal auction in 1948. And uh, doubters of the main coin have sometimes claimed that this is a possible source of the coin. However, as our, our friend uh, Svein Gulbeck points out, these coins that were sold in 1948 were not from Class N. None of them were Class N, and hence they could not be the source of the main coin. Moreover, these coins that were sold by auction in 1948 are not duplicates, and neither are any of the collections of coins that have been sold off over the years from the University of Oslo. So the university, when they sell off 
uh, archaeological coins, they only sell duplicates, right? So they always make sure to keep at least one specimen of any given known type or style in their collection, and they only sell duplicates. Now, the so this 1948 group was just another sell-off of duplicates, as the university has done repeatedly uh, over the decades. And hence, none of these sell-offs could have possibly included the main coin. Why is this? Because the main coin is unique. Its features do not exactly match any other recorded coin. Uh, it seems to be the only known specimen of its exact type. Although it falls into the broad class and category, it is still unique in its details, and hence the university never would have sold it off because they only sell off duplicates. So, th so it seems that if the main coin was acquired somehow on the market, legally or illegally, it had to have gone by some channel that managed to keep itself completely secret and unknown and unrecorded by scholars, which is extremely unusual and difficult, and hence it would have been hard to find and very expensive uh, to acquire. And these various recorded sell-offs cannot be the source of the main coin. Furthermore, as Gulbeck points out, the coin is very worn and corroded. And this is more common to single finds. Okay, so coins that have been extensively handled, that have traveled and changed hands, that maybe have been worn on the body, like this coin, tend to be more corroded. Whereas coins that are easier to acquire come from large hordes, and those tend to be much better preserved because they're protected and insulated by the other coins around them of the same composition. So if you're going to get a coin that's clearly identifiable, that is actually easier and cheaper because they come in these hordes. Whereas a coin like the main coin is more unusual, it shows more extensive wear and use, and it is more char characteristic of the single find, which is what Guy Melgren claimed this coin to be. So by all of these uh, arguments, Gulbeck actually uh, concludes that it, it can't be proven, but that all available evidence points to the main coin being a genuine American archaeological find. However, if this is true, it of course raises the final question of how could the coin have gotten there? How did it end up at this site in Maine, and what are the implications for the history of North America and of contact between North America and Europe? Well, as I said, this is the only pre-Columbian Norse artifact ever found in the United States. There are other supposed finds, most of which have been debunked or are dubious. This is the only confirmed, authentic, pre-Columbian European object found in the U.S. Now, it shouldn't be that surprising, as uh, Gulbeck points out, when you consider that coins often traveled very far in the medieval world. And even uh, Viking hordes in places like Sweden or Iceland <clears throat> are often found to contain coins from as far away as Baghdad and Constantinople. They were simply small, durable objects that could have value for various reasons, and they often changed hands many times and ended up in far-flung places where it's almost impossible to trace back the exact routes that they could have followed. So hence, it may be impossible to know the precise route by which this Norwegian coin ended up in Maine, but this is just one of many um, mysteries of archaeology, especially involving coins. Now, if we suppose that the find is genuine, then we can make a basic guess, a sort of conjectural reconstruction of the life of this coin and how it ended up moving from its place of origin ultimately to America. So the coin was minted in Norway between 1069 and 1080. Now, properly speaking, this is after the Viking Age was really already over. So the term Viking can be used somewhat loosely, but 
It originally means uh, war parties of Norse raiders traveling out and attacking surrounding lands. So if you were simply a peaceful person sitting at home in Scandinavia, then you were not a Viking. And it seems that uh, Olaf Kira and his royal administration in Norway fell into this latter category. And in fact, the title Olaf Kira actually means Olaf the Peaceful. So this was not, strictly speaking, a Viking coin. And in fact, most of Scandinavia by this time had been pacified and had settled into a comparatively more peaceful and stable lifestyle, especially after their conversion to Christianity. So Olaf Kira and his predecessors in Norway were Christians, and they had largely converted to Christianity in order to have better trade and diplomatic relations with Europe. It was taboo for Christians to trade with pagans, and so hence for the Norsemen, converting to Christianity was a way of integrating themselves into the more peaceable and commercial and prosperous world of high medieval Europe. And Olaf Kira very much fell into this pattern. However, his father, Harald Hardrada, was a bit different. So uh, his predecessor was his father, Harald Hardrada, who was... Uh, more warlike and more aggressive, and he had actually made a claim for the English throne in 1066 at the same time that the Normans did uh, after the death of Edward the Confessor. And they actually invaded England in 1066 a few months before the Normans did, and they were defeated at the Battle of Stamford Bridge in northern England. So you know, people speak very much about the glorious, you know, conquest of England by, by the Normans, but it was actually possible in large part because the English forces were already drained and exhausted by having to battle uh, the Norwegians at Stamford Bridge. So the Norwegians lost the Battle of Stamford Bridge and Harald Hardrada was killed in the battle. Olaf was present in this invasion of England, but he stayed out of the battle and actually remained on ship while the battle went on, and his father was killed. His elder brother succeeded to the throne, and Olaf shared power as a prince for three more years until his brother died in 1069, and Olaf assumed the throne as sole king and ruler of Norway. Olaf was reportedly a very successful king who instituted all kinds of reforms and improvements that strengthened the kingdom. He founded the city of Bergen, reorganized the military, and created a complex network of marriage alliances to secure peace and close relations with other countries, including Denmark and England, under its new ruler, William the Conqueror. He recognized and accepted the independence of the church in Norway, and he began recording laws, provincial laws in writing. He was described physically as a tall, blonde man, perhaps not surprising for a Norwegian, very taciturn and stoic, but he made good company after he'd had some drink. So he coined a series of coins to help facilitate commerce both within Norway and with neighboring countries. These coins show his very crude likeness, usually on one side, and a simple uh, Greek cross on the other side. And they were circulated most likely to Iceland, although no Olaf Kira coins specifically have been found in Iceland. And others clearly did travel and have been found in Finland, Sweden, the Low Countries, England, and at least one as far as Lebanon. Could they have gone beyond to Iceland and Greenland? It's certainly possible. There are many archaeological sites that haven't been investigated. There were many settlements in both Iceland and Greenland that were later abandoned and cover covered over with glaciers. So there may be all sorts of materials, including Olaf Kira coins, that simply haven't been found in those countries. So this particular coin certainly could have traveled with Norse people to Iceland and Greenland. And from Greenland, could it have been traded to Native American people in what's now Canada? Could it have been raided in battle when uh, Norse people and indigenous Americans fought or clashed? That is also possible. Could it have been taken from a burial site? 
Many of the Norse coins that have been found in Europe were interred with important people as grave goods, and it's completely possible that uh, those uh, graves have been raided over the years, as today they are often discovered and excavated and their contents put into uh, scholarly collections. This particular coin might have been raided from a grave or a tomb. Now, you probably know that there was a great deal of previous contact between Norsemen and Native Americans. This is a confirmed part of history, <clears throat> but interestingly, it predates this coin. So according to the Norse sagas, Vikings reached Greenland in about the late 900s AD and created a series of sizable settlements there. Then, a series of voyages led by Leif Erikson left from Greenland and traveled further southward and westward down the coast of North America, and they founded a series of settlements in these lands beyond Greenland, the largest of which they called Vinland, and which they described as a warm and pleasant environment where wild vines grew. However, after a number of years in Vinland, the Norse came into conflict with local people whom they called Skraelings, or small, ugly people. And they tried at points to establish peaceable and friendly relations with these so-called Skraelings. But eventually, relations broke down, and the Vikings were driven out of Vinland and withdrew back to Greenland. So those settlements around Vinland were abandoned. Now, it's interesting that the, the Vikings made such extensive settlement and contact in America, but they were not able to hold on permanently in the way that later Europeans, like the Spanish under Columbus, uh, were able to do. And it seems the main reason for this difference is that the Vikings did not spread diseases like other later Europeans did. They had set out and created long-lasting settlements in the very cold far north, in places like Iceland and Greenland. And these small settlements uh, set up in these far northern kingdoms with very harsh winters uh, basically became like quarantine sites. They, the crowd diseases like smallpox and typhus and influenza that were so endemic in Europe actually died out. They didn't have enough population and environment to thrive. And so the Vikings, by the time they reached Vinland, they no longer were carrying these lethal crowd diseases, and they didn't pass them on to Native Americans. And so once they created these settlements, they really had to contend on something more like an even playing field with the local populations. And ultimately, they found that they were able to maintain their foothold in Greenland, but not further down in North America. And this contrasts, of course, with Columbus, whose voyages touched off massive devastating epidemics and paved the way for this large-scale invasion of the Americas. Now, the Vinland sagas were known and circulated for hundreds of years, but for centuries they were regarded as dubious, and they were only confirmed by archaeological discoveries in the 20th century. So this is one of the many examples that I like to point out, where oral histories that were passed down among populations over the years actually turned out to be credible and corroborated by other sources of evidence. So firstly, the Viking settlement at Lons o Mado at the northern tip of Newfoundland was discovered in the 1900s. And this particular site has been excavated and the Viking buildings there were re reconstructed and can be seen today. Newfoundland, of course, is not technically the mainland of North America. It's a large island that is part of Canada, but it's much closer, of course, to the mainland than Greenland. And for a long time, this site at Lons Omido was the farthest south that scholars knew of, and it was often speculated that this might be what was described in the sagas as Vinland, and that possibly other smaller sites in the surrounding area might be the other uh, places referred to in, in the sagas as small temporary settlements. However, in recent years, just within the past five years, archaeologists have discovered another site at Point Rosé at the southern end of Newfoundland, 
which is now being excavated and is probably another significant Norse site. And it was first found actually by satellite, by looking at the uh, indentations in the ground from satellite images. And today, Point Rosé almost, you know, semi-officially can be called the new farthest south and farthest west known Norse settlement in America. And it raises the possibility that all kinds of other sites might eventually be found using indications or clues from satellite images. At the same time, others have also argued for the possibility that another Viking settlement that in the sagas is called Hop might have been located in New Brunswick. So this, the sagas report a, a smaller sort of satellite colony that was set amidst marshes and where people collected salmon and wild grapes. And as current scholars have noted, northern New Brunswick is the farthest northern extent of wild grapes in North America. And there are places on the northern coast of New Brunswick that are marshy and where the waters are rich in salmon. So this might be what was referred to as hop, but nothing has been excavated as so far as I know. Nothing further beyond Newfoundland has been confirmed as a Norse archaeological site, despite a lot of dubious and wild speculation about stone structures in New England, such as the Newport Stone Tower, uh, Dighton Rock in Massachusetts, uh, various small stone chambers around uh, New England. But all of this is of, you know, doubtful and disputed origin. So it it's, you know, open to question whether any of that has anything to do with the Vikings. Now, as I said, Vinland and its surrounding satellite colonies were eventually abandoned for military and political reasons, and the Norse withdrew back to Greenland, and the settlements at Greenland were able to survive for several hundred more years, up into the 14 and 1500s, until they eventually uh, were abandoned as well because of the climate getting colder and the expanding glaciers. So uh, you remember the little ice age that struck Europe between the 1500s and the 1700s. It likewise affected most of the globe and environments like Greenland that had been livable during the late medieval warm period became impossible, at least for people living a European sort of lifestyle as this little ice age advanced. So the Greenland settlement also was eventually abandoned, but it did last for several centuries. So if we consider that these Norse people did remain in Greenland, we then have the question, how could this coin have gotten to Maine? Is that plausible and how did it happen? Well, the whole eastern seaboard of North America, running from the Chesapeake Basin all the way up through New England, the Maritime Provinces, Newfoundland, was inhabited by various Algonquian peoples of various sizes and varying political and economic power. And there was very extensive migration and trade all over this whole eastern side of North America. And you might remember from my lecture about the statuette of a farming goddess, this period, the 1100s, 1200s, was the same time that the Mississippian civilization was flourishing in the interior of North America. And that civilization had very extensive trade and diplomatic reach, spreading all the way from the Atlantic coast to the Pacific. They had goods, various kinds of stone, uh, obsidian, uh, silver, that clearly came from thousands of miles in all different directions. And so this eastern seaboard of North America would have been part of that very extensive active network of trade and communication. So objects of high value, we know, did not stay in one place. And specifically, this Goddard site on Naskiag Point in Maine was clearly a significant trade hub. It was uh, possibly seasonally inhabited, but even still, while it was inhabited, it was probably the largest town in the region that's now Maine. The middens there were excavated in the 1950s and 60s, and among the objects found there, aside from the Norse coin, was also a burin, or a chip-sharpened stone, used for peeling or, or cutting materials, 
which was not from that area but clearly came from the Arctic and is characteristic of Inuit people at that time. And so it somehow was carried and traded all the way from the Arctic lands to that site in Maine. And this is just another clue that this was a major hub of, of moving goods and people, probably both over land and by sea, since it's on the coast. So it's completely possible that the coin was somehow traded or brought southward from a point of contact between the Norse people in Greenland and the Americans. As I said, it was perforated so that it could be worn as a pendant or possibly also to secure it and transport it as a valuable object. The value of this coin surely was not as an exchange currency since there are no other known instances of European coins from this period in America, but probably it was valued for its beauty and its exoticism, the fact that it would have been unusual and exotic for people in America. The Goddard site flourished as a place of settlement and trade, particularly between 1180 and 1235, and then most likely it also declined after the early 1200s because of the climate getting colder, just as in Europe, uh, towns and cities suffered after about 1300 because of the changing climate. So probably at some point in the 12 or 1300s when this site was gradually abandoned, this uh, object was somehow lost or, or thrown away and ended up in a sort of pile of discarded refuse on the site. It was uh, discovered in the summer of 1957 when the Goddard site was being excavated by two amateur local archaeologists, Guy Melgren and Ed Runge. And at that time in the 1950s, there were not nearly as strict laws and practices about archaeological excavation. There was more leeway for amateur or avocational uh, archaeologists to go out and search for sites and collect objects on their own. And there was not strict, there were not strict standards about documenting precisely where you found any given object. So we don't have any records saying precisely where and when Guy Melgren found the coin. But rather, over the course of several years, they excavated and discovered about 30,000 objects, all of which they later gave to the Maine State Museum over the course of the 1970s. And Guy Melgren made no discernible effort to sell the item or to get money from it, nor to promote it or publicize it as a significant find. Rather, he simply noted it as something unusual, and later in 1959, it was reported in a local bulletin that it had, it had been found. So if we are to uh, accuse Guy Melgren of falsifying this find, we have to ask why he didn't behave in the way that hoaxsters normally do behave, which is by trumpeting their find, uh, exaggerating or promoting its significance, and trying to get fame or money out of it. So far as we can see, Guy Melgren Melgren simply didn't do this. Uh, and this, I think, undermines the idea that the coin is merely a hoax. And I know of many similar instances that I have pointed to at, at other times of strange or unusual objects that have been found in various places and that are, in one way or another, uh, accused of being a hoax. Uh, such as, for example, the Voynich Manuscript, which is sometimes called the world's most mysterious book. It's a book written in an unknown, undeciphered script that was found reportedly by a book collector named Wilfred Voynich in a sort of reject pile of books at the Jesuit College at Frascati in Italy that they were trying to sell off. And he has been accused of forging this unusual book because it's so strange and because it hasn't been identified for more than a hundred years. But this Voynich manuscript, as with the main coin, uh, the allegation that it's a hoax really only raises more questions than it answers. For example, how was it created or acquired? 
Why was it planted in the particular place where it was planted? And why did the person who brought it to scholarly attention make little or no effort to benefit from it? So Wilfred Voynich ultimately also donated the Voynich manuscript, in, in his case, to the Beinecke Rare Books Library at Yale. Uh, he made no money from it, and there's no evidence that he really tried to, to benefit from it in one way or another, in the same way that Guy Melgren simply presented this coin to others and did not make particular speculations about it and made no money from it. So I think there's a common uh, pattern of people sort of blaming the messenger when something very strange and inexplicable is discovered to simply avoid the difficult questions that the object raises by simply uh, alleging that the discoverer is a hoaxer. But all in all, the circumstantial evidence, I think, points to the main coin being a genuine find. And that lastly leaves open the question of the implications of the coin. How much transoceanic contact might there have been between Northern Europe and North America uh, before Columbus? Even if we put aside the sort of wild uh, speculations about rune stones in Minnesota and mysterious towers in Rhode Island and so forth, we may have to grapple with the question that there might have been a significant amount of trade and even mutual awareness <clears throat> between the Norse people and the indigenous Americans, whom they called Skraelings, and that this coin might simply be one small piece of evidence that happens to have been discovered a number of decades ago, <clears throat> while others have not. And we have to question whether there might be many other coins or other objects like it yet to be found at all kinds of other sites in North America and the outlying islands of North America. You know, if we take seriously this discovery of a new site at Point Rosé that certainly seems almost surely to be another Norse site, and that was just found a few years ago by means of satellite imagery, well, then we have to ask, are there all kinds of other sites like it? And was there even longer lasting and more extensive and impactful trade and contact between these peoples beyond what's suggested in the surviving Viking sagas? So I would venture to guess that there may be many more items out there still buried somewhere uh, under land, in marshes, under the ocean even, like the main coin that simply haven't been found yet. And perhaps if and when we have excavated more of these important sites, we will find it foolish and short-sighted that so many scholars for such a long time rejected the main Norse coin as a genuine find and as a revealing clue to the extensive trade and travel and really cosmopolitan experiences of Native Americans before Columbus. So thank you, and I will hope to continue this series further next month. I will be teaching this fall semester, so I might not be able to produce as much, but hopefully you'll be hearing more from me soon.